Hi, I'm Aaron Powell, and today we're back with another special bonus episode of Free Thoughts with fan favorite Peter Van Dorn. Peter's here to tell us about some of his favorite articles from the new issue of Regulation Magazine, for which he's the editor-in-chief. If you like what you hear, you can check out Regulation online by heading to cato.org slash regulation. The first article I talk about is, uh, its purpose is to help people at dinner parties talk about trade. Trade is a very difficult uh, and challenging concept to talk about, I think, if you're outside the economics community. Um, the standard position of, of, I won't say most, but a standard neoclassical economics position is that unilateral free trade is first best. It doesn't matter what other countries do, whether they're mean, nasty, protectionist, not protectionist, whatever. Our first best policy is to import whatever we make sense and to export whatever makes sense and consumers are better off. This doesn't, this, uh, so my charge to Pierre Lemieux, the author of this article was this economics view of things doesn't seem to fly very well in ordinary discourse. So why don't you discuss all the arguments against China and what it does and whether they are meaningful or not and then give a uh, perspective on how to discuss such arguments. So he did that, though, in the context of analyzing Peter Navarro's intellectual history and the transformation of that history. For those who don't know, Peter Navarro is uh, the head of the, uh, and let me get the name right here, the Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy within the White House, which is an office within the White House that didn't exist until President Trump created it. The first and only head of this office is Peter Navarro. He is a PhD trained economist from Harvard and uh, his, this, the book review that Pierre Lemieux does in regulation is discusses what he wrote in the 80s and then how he's become, uh, he's changed so dramatically from that in his, his current position. Um, so I'll give you just some stylized facts from that article, uh, but I urge people to read it to help them engage in better dinner party conversation about trade. First, if I'll ask Aaron, what what percent of American consumer expenditures actually end up in China? In other words, the the payments on things we buy that say made in China and the the uh, payments to factor suppliers for things that come from China that in turn are made in uh, are, are components of U.S. goods. So what percent of U.S. consumer expenditures actually literally physically end up as dollars spent in China? I'm going to say less than 10 percent. It's 1.9 percent. <laughs> so it's not very much. Uh, that's and that's so why are we having such an issue over chinese trade and and uh, pierre shrugs his head and he doesn't know it's only 1.9% of consumer expenditures two thirds of american consumption is domestic services right the, 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 and the point of this is the point of his article is Manufacturing is so productive, it's so much more productive over time, it just requires fewer and fewer people and fewer and fewer dollars. Most of what we do now is services for each other and those things, some of them are traded, the US finance and insurance are, are traded goods, we're very good at those in international markets. But a lot of what people do for each other is domestic non-traded consumption, education, healthcare, uh, things like that, real estate services. And so just we need to ratchet down the rhetoric about trade. And then Lemieux, the final fact I'll, I'll provide is that it's manufacturing productivity increases over time have decreased employment. That's if you want to think of why manufacturing pro uh, employment keeps going down, the answer isn't trade. It's the increased productivity trade. Services are much more difficult to, to have productivity increases and thus all of us end up doing service kinds of things and uh, rather than work in manufacturing because we don't need many people uh, to do that. The second article, um, completely different topic, uh, and I spoke about this at the staff meeting that you attended a couple days ago, and that is, why, do the, why does the federal government own so much land in the West? And 
I've always wondered about this. I, I knew the East Coast had mostly private land and the West was was federal. And yet we had the Homestead Act in 1862, which said the Louisiana Purchase and all those lands that we've uh, bought or conquered uh, over time, uh, we're going to give those away to people where the, the federal government initially owned them. But in fact, the United States is about private property and we're going to not even going to charge you. We're going to let people settle the West. They can get 160 acres and they put up stakes. And the movies showed us all about this, particularly in Oklahoma. And uh, you could get 160 acres for free as long as you farm it and title it and, and, and engage in productive activity on it. What happened, though, is that in the arid west, west of the 100th meridian, 160 acres would, would not be economically viable. You could it, the, the, the lack of rainfall meant the crop yields were so low that it would produce insufficient food and or income from cash crops to actually support a family. So these 160-acre households out west failed and failed and failed. John Wesley Powell, uh, the Powell Dam in the west is named after him, an American geologist and, and, and uh, a surveyor of the west at the behest of Congress, reported back to Congress in 1879 that the acreage for homesteading west of the 100th meridian should be 2,600 acres, not 160. But this recommendation ran into the buzzsaw of populist Jeffersonian yeoman farmer in America. Uh, and the people would not have it. They really protest. They said this was the, 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 the dream of, of going west and then settling and getting a family farm was in jeopardy. And so Congress declined to change the law. And the problem is, that these 160-acre uh, homesteads were not economically viable, so they all failed. So rather than enlarge and change how much land was given away at once, Congress then started to subsidize uh, dams and water reclamation in the West to keep these little farms going. Timber, mining, and uh, grazing needed hundreds of hundreds of thousands of acres. The economies of scale of these things were immense. And it was so dry, you you needed to rotate your cattle, particularly for grazing. So these activities, which is what the West, made sense in the West, were made illegal in effect. You couldn't do these things legally under the Homestead Act because you couldn't acquire enough land to actually make them economically viable. And so this, in response, there an Eastern intellectual movement coming out of the Yale School of Forestry said, we need government ownership and scientific management of the land. And this was the response. So <clears throat> if, like many stories I tell in regulatory history, this is a classic one, which is we needed to change the way property rights were allocated in order to make sense, if you will. And because of cozy and transaction costs and government rules about you couldn't acquire parcels big enough it was illegal to do so. And so the lawless West was born and the Eastern intellectuals came up with a, uh, a, a environmentally oriented stewardship as the answer. And guess what? We are still trapped in that kind of rhetoric. Um, the fight between the Bundys and, and grazing and the BLM that ended up with uh, a person shot uh, recently. All of that is the kind of tragic result of you need thousands of acres to graze cattle and there was no legal way uh, to get that. And so th this article, I think, if you read anything about federal lands, this is nice one-stop shopping for, for that history. The third article I mentioned is a review I do in my working papers uh, summaries, a, re a review of a paper about the stylized facts of mortgage defaults in the uh, we're 10 years out now from the 2008 financial crisis and again i think the standard dinner party conversation says that there were misguided mortgages uh handed out and it was the fault of the companies they didn't uh judge people's incomes they just handed out money for houses willy-nilly and that was really crazy and we need to stop that somehow so again, I will put Aaron on the spot here and just uh, – so the paper I review examines the history of defaults among AAA-rated mortgages, both 
prime and subprime cumulative defaults from 1987 or for mortgages issued 1987 through 2008 with defaults being measured up through 2013 all right so this is in effect uh af- or allowing for the defaults to occur after the financial crisis again these are triple a rated securitized mortgages so called mortgage backed securities so through 2013, what was the cumulative, not just after 08, but the, the default rate on everything MBS that had been issued since 1987 on the AAA rated mortgages as an, uh, as an entirety? So what percent of them defaulted? Correct. Give me what you think the dinner party answer would be. You don't have to guess the right answer. You know oh, where I'm I'm sure that the dinner party answer is probably quite high. Correct. Um, but – I'll I'll go with my I'll stick to my prior answer too and say less than ten percent. Correct. It's two point three percent. That's it. Now, how about subprime AAA? Now you say what there there was subprime AAA. Well, yes, alle- allegedly that was part of the problem. It was the so-called overrating by the rating agencies of these mortgages that, that lulled investors into buying these things that were misinformed and misguided. You know. Et cetera, et cetera. So, what was the cumulative default rate on subprime AAA mortgages, 1980 issued 87 through 2008, measured through 2013? Based on your prior answer, I'll say 4%? 0.42%. Okay. Just stunning. So, I read this paper and I said, what? Because I've been a sort of dissident on the standard story. I, well, I tend to be anyway. I dig for stuff to try to change the conversation. So subprime AAA mortgage def- cumulative default rate, 0.42%. The yield on these securities, all right, in the, just to give you a sense, uh, if you bought a 10-year treasury in 2008, the yield on those was anywhere between 2.5 to 3 something. The yield on these securities that I just mentioned through 2013 is 24 to 3.3%. The same as, I mean, when you think of AAA, you think of treasuries as the anchor. So if these mortgages were as good as treasuries, then the yield on them should be as good as treasuries issued at the same time. And the answer is the yields have been the same. Okay. Finally, The total cumulative losses in billions of dollars or trillions of dollars on these AAA rated mortgage backed securities through 2013 is. Sorry to put you on the. I don't even know what order of magnitude you're talking about here. It's $350 billion. It's not, I mean, it's not that much. The SNL crisis was uh, in real dollars probably um, greater. And the the uh, Obama Recovery Stimulus Act th- poured more into the economy than this loss. So anyway, this paper is a head scratcher. It just says, why are the stories of the financial crisis, why are they always about these misguided mortgages when the actual losses on these mortgages don't seem to be, they're not zero, but they're not what at the level that everyone thinks. Thank you, Peter. Free Thoughts listeners, if you'd like to read any of these or other articles in regulation, visit cato.org slash regulation. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.